Hola, YouTube. Me llamo Alan. Uh, that's about all the Spanish I know. Sorry. Since I can't talk Spanish, let's talk metal instead. There we go. We got there. So for tonight's video, I want to say from the get go, don't take this one too seriously. This episode could very easily have been titled What Grinds My Gears? And yeah, as such, there's a thought exercise here, but it's, you know, partly tongue in cheek. Uh, there is a point to it as well. It relates back to a topic that popped up on one of the recent heavy metallurgy streams that I did uh, with Marty over on the Marty Worm channel. We were discussing something about, you know, 80s black metal. And, you know, I had mentioned a couple of bands, Venom, Hellhammer, etc. And I think it was Marty, you know, I'd also mentioned, like, you know, oh, you know, you know, Running Wild's in there too. And I was, I remember very distinctly, my brain kind of paused for like half a second. And I said, yeah, early Running Wild too. And I could feel this, this little nagging thing in the back of my brain that something wasn't quite right. And so I, I circled back around to that later after the stream was over. It's like, why did that make me pause when Marty mentioned running wild because their name does come up with 80s black metal pretty commonly and the bottom line is having thought about it i've never liked the notion of running wild being considered a black metal band i doesn't feel like they belong in that genre whatsoever so here's the deal and most folks know this but in case some don't when most people today use the phrase black metal to describe a type of heavy metal, they're almost always referring to the stuff that came out of Norway and Sweden and a few other places beginning in maybe the very late 80s, but especially the early 90s. They're talking about bands like Mayhem, Burzum, Emperor, Dark Throne, Immortal, etc. That is what most folks think of when they hear the phrase black metal. But of course, there was an entire generation of black metal a decade earlier than that, going back to Venom and bands that kind of followed in their footsteps. Uh, the 90s bands, of course, were fans of that stuff. They built upon some of those aesthetics, but they gave black metal a more codified sound. You know, they built in certain musical elements and aesthetics. While all those bands are kind of distinct and had their own thing going on, you know, there started to be a, you know, some elements in common musically that linked you know, those Norwegian and Swedish bands together. And again, yes, there were a few bands from other places like Japan's Psy, for example. But when you go back and look at the 80s black metal bands, they weren't nearly as unified by anything as the 90s style of black metal was. In fact, while black metal was a term used to describe a subgenre of heavy metal during the 1980s, the definition of black metal in the 1980s was simply bands who sing about Satan a lot. And therein lies the problem. Frankly, I never like it when people use the lyrical content of music to try to describe the style of music. This is what grinds my gears. When you think about some of those 80s black metal bands like Venom and Merciful Fate, yes, they both sing about Satan a lot. And beyond that, musically, they don't have much in common. So if you're trying to describe one of these bands to somebody for the first time, I come up to you and I say, hey, I just heard about this band called Venom. What do they sound like? And you tell me, well, Alan, they sound like a black metal band. They're black metal. Okay, that tells me what they're going to sing about. I can expect a lot of songs about Satan this and Satan that. But it tells me nothing at all what the band sounds like. That's the problem with this type of genre based on lyrical content. Another perfect example of it is the term Christian metal. Christian metal just tells you that 
the band members are Christians and the lyrics have Christian themes to them. They sing about Jesus and Jesus related topics a lot. That doesn't tell you anything about what the bands sound like. You know, Christian bands cover a pretty wide gambit from Striper to Mortification. They're both Christian bands, and the similarity stops right there. I know a lot of Striper fans who would never listen to Mortification. A lot of Amy Grant fans out there. They're not interested in listening to Mortification. I, musically, they're very, very distinct from one another. And this is the issue with 80s black metal, is that, well, all a band had to do was sing about Satan a whole bunch and you put it in that category, regardless of what particular style of music they were playing. Whether they were, again, doing you know, crazy lead twin guitar attacks of Merciful Fate, or, you know, the sort of, you know, punky motorhead worship of Venom, or you know, Bathory, or whatever else. Um, that's always grinds my gears. Uh, that I never like that approach. And that's where the running wild problem comes in. You know, running wild did sing about Satan some, and as such, they kind of got lumped in with black metal by some people. But even by that lyrical standard, it's always bothered me a little bit. It's like, did running wild really do that many Satan songs? Did, did they say Satan enough times to become part of the club and get their black metal merit badge? I, it's always bugged me. And so I've spent more time than I should have sitting down and combing through lyrics to some 80s black metal albums, including the first two Running Wild albums, to see how many Satan songs they all do. So figured if I'm going to complain about something that's actually kind of inane, I might as well try to come up with some numbers to back me up. So let's walk through some examples. What I've done is I've dug through the first two Venom albums, the first two Merciful Fate albums, and the first two Running Wild albums. You know, Venom, Merciful Fate, no one's going to argue that those bands clearly have the black metal tag associated with them. Clearly bands that were pro Satan all the way. But again, uh, Running Wild, I'm not sure they belong in that club, so I'm using them to compare. Let's start with the band that began it all, and let's check the numbers on Venom's first album, Welcome to Hell. Uh, Welcome to Hell, this breaks down uh, with about five songs are all about Satan stuff. You've got Sons of Satan, Welcome to Hell, Witching Hour, 1,000 Days in Sodom, and In League with Satan. All of those, yeah, the lyrical content is, you know, pretty heavy Satan. 1,000 Days in Sodom is a little bit on the borderline. And that is a thing I should mention here. There are going to be some songs where it's like, well, there's maybe a little bit of a reference to it. Is it evil enough to put in the Satan category? Obviously, on a few things, I had to make a judgment call. I tried to be consistent in thinking that it had to have you know, enough of kind of you know, a pure biblical satanic thing going on in the lyrics to put it in that category. If the song is just about spooky stuff, ghosts or some altars. No, I didn't count those. There needed to be some overt references to Satan, Lucifer, that kind of thing to get in the category. So by my count, Welcome to Hell has about five songs all about Satan and about five songs that have really almost nothing to do with Satan. In the non-Satanic half of Welcome to Hell, you've got, you know, Schizo. Well, that's about, you know, crazy schizophrenic murderer, but there's nothing in the lyrics that invoke Satan or Lucifer or anything like that. You've got a couple of, you know, songs about sex with poison and red light fever. You've got a song about drugs with angel dust, and you've got a song just about, you know, sort of, you know, the, you know, crazy living hard rock and roll lifestyle, live like an angel, die like the devil. Now, see, there it has devil in the title even, but the song really has nothing to do with Satan or any satanic topic. It's just, you know, Live hard, burn out fast, yeehaw, party it up. It's not a satanic song. All right, so the first Satan album, or sorry, the first Venom album, 50-50 split. Now, 
<clears throat> let's move on to the album that really started it all, Venom's second offering, Black Metal. 11 tracks on here. This one's got about seven tracks that lean into the Satanism vibe. Uh, you've got the Black Metal, the title track, you know, and they coined the phrase, good for them. You've got, you know, To Hell and Back, you've got uh, Leave Me in Hell, Sacrifice, Heavens on Fire, uh, Don't Burn the Witch, and At War with Satan. All of those, yeah, pretty heavy satanic lyrical themes. And that leaves only four songs that don't have that kind of theme. Although, again, two of these are a little bit borderline. Buried Alive and Raise the Dead, you could make a case for that maybe falling on the satanic side, but yeah, again, one's about creepy being buried alive stuff. The other is kind of zombie stuff. There really aren't any, you know, overt satanic references. Those are not songs with courses of Oh Satan, Hail Satan, Yay Satan, or, you know, anything like that. So I put them in the non-Satan category. You know, then you've got, you know, the goofy sex song, Teacher's Pet, and then the sort of, you know, spooky historical figure song in Countess Bathory. So you know, with black metal here, we see, you know, the benchmark being about two thirds of the album. Seven out of 11 tracks have a satanic lyrical theme. You're still apparently allowed to have at least four non-Satan songs on your black metal album in the early 1980s. All right, how does Merciful Fate stack up against that? I don't have Melissa on CD, but uh, we can start with Melissa on the old picture disc. But uh, I think instead, it's easier to hold. We'll work with Melissa on the original LP. If you're asking yourself, why do I have both the picture disc and the normal LP, it's because I'm a sick little monkey, and you know that. You didn't have to ask that question. Don't waste my time with silly questions. There are stupid questions, no matter what your teacher told you. Even if you were the teacher's pet, kind of tying it back into the Venom thing there. Anyway, what's the breakdown on Melissa? Uh, turns out Melissa is very pro-Satan. About six out of the seven tracks have a pretty clear satanic lyrical theme to them. Really, the only one that doesn't is Curse of the Pharaohs. And again, you know, spooky song, killer song as well, excellent song. Uh, you know, it's dealing with, you know, creepy kind of horror stuff, but there's nothing there in Curse of the Pharaohs that, you know, ties into a satanic thing, which kind of makes sense. I mean, it's talking about a curse from ancient Egypt. I don't think a lot of ancient Egyptians were Christian, so they probably didn't believe in Satan. It wasn't really a thing. You know, they had their own pantheon going on. But yeah, all the other songs like, you know, Evil, Into the Coven, At the Sound of the Demon Bell, Black Funeral, Satan's Fall, Melissa. Yeah, they all have lyrics, you know, pretty clear on, you know, you know black masses, black upside down crosses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, Merciful Fate, definitely, you know, going heavy on the satanic lyrical theme. Let's look at the second Merciful Fate album as well. Tried to look at the first two albums by each band as I was doing this. So uh, don't break the oath. We'll just stick to the CD copy. You, you don't need to know how many copies of this I have on vinyl. I'm a sick little monkey. Um, with Don't Break the Oath, it's about five out of the eight tracks have a heavy satanic lyrical theme. Uh, the instrumental, of course, not going to worry about that. Uh, again, some of the tracks on this one, little borderline, but I've got you know, Nightmare, Night of the Unborn, The Oath, of course, Welcome Princess of Hell, and Come to the Sabbath. Those I feel pretty clearly fall on the satanic side. The three non-satanic tracks, A Dangerous Meeting, good example of one that, yes, has a cool spooky spirits, ghost seance kind of theme to it, but there's no overt references to Lucifer. So maybe you can make a case that it should be on the satanic side, but I, again, I'm looking for a you know, real clear Satan stuff. So I left that one out. Uh, similarly, Desecration of Souls, you might could put that over into the satanic category, but going through the lyrics specifically, there was a lot of stuff about creepy cemetery stuff and spirits and souls, but uh, it, there's not, it's not, you know, like, you know, the oath or come to the Sabbath. So I put it out. 
And then Gypsy. Gypsy makes you know, a reference to, you know, I'm the devil's child, but it's one line. It's not, it doesn't seem like it's a main part of the song. So I shifted it over there. Nevertheless, Don't Break the Oath with five out of eight tracks. Yeah, again, you're running you in that, you know, 60, you know, percent, two thirds kind of range for satanic content, much like he had on black metal. Okay, so those are kind of the standards that we're going to then compare the early running wild stuff to. So let's look at the first running wild album, Aids to Purgatory. Uh, the count here is about four out of eight. Uh, here's what I've got in the satanic category. Victim of state's power. Now, this is a really weird one. There are a couple of lines very clearly about, you know, oh, you know, hey, you know, pay attention to what Satan did when he told God no, and, you know, follow Lucifer's example, he'll lead the way. So, yeah, that could definitely pro-Satan kind of thing. The point of the song, however, is very much about standing up to authority. It's a political song, a lot more than it's some kind of, you know, hail Satan type song. So it's a weird one. I did put it in the satanic lyrics category because it has a couple of lines there that are, yeah, written such that eh, the Satan imagery does come through very clearly. But it's not a song all about devil worship. It's, again, it's one of their political songs. They did several of them early on. Uh, Black Demon I put on this side, Preacher I put on this side, and Adrian, Son of Satan, I put on this side. None of those I don't think will surprise anybody. On the not-so-satanic side, you've got Soldiers of Hell. Now, the title there does kind of make it sound like Satan's Army thing. But again, reading through the lyrics, there's really just like, you know, it's more sort of a hell-raising, you know, song. You might could shift it over to the Satan column. I don't know. It wasn't, it didn't feel nearly as strong in the satanic leanings as the other tracks. Also, Diabolic Force, not as much. Genghis Khan, you know, that's more along the lines of Countess Bathory, you know, take a sort of, you know, historically portrayed vicious figure and talk about them. And then Prisoner of Our Time, which again, more of a political song, rebellion song, all of that. So here you're looking at about a 50-50 split, which is about where Welcome to Hell fell. Um, where it gets very interesting is what happens on the next album, Branded and Exiled the second Running Wild full length. There's eight tracks on this one, and not a single one of them has a satanic lyrical theme. And it's kind of funny, reading through the lyrics, there are several tracks where they could have brought up something about Satan, Lucifer, the devil, or whatever. And it's almost like they made it a point to write around those names and to not invoke them for anything. The only time I noticed that the name or word Satan even came up is in the very last track, Chains and Leather. And that's just one of those anthemic tunes, you know, where you get all the headbangers, you know, raising their fist in the air, you know, chains and leather, we all wear them. It's just, there's one line that, you know, even Satan wears leather. That's it. It just goes on from there. So, yeah, there's really nothing on this album that should be considered satanic lyrical material this is not a black metal album by any stretch of the imagination uh, you know there's a pentagram on the cover they had that weird pseudo pentagram logo it's actually got a couple of extra lines added down there at the bottom you can see it better over here on the cover of gates to purgatory um this album has nothing to do though in terms of the 80s black metal style, which is, again, defined solely on lyrical content, there's nothing there. So where does that leave us? Well, you've got Venom, you know, again, doing about 50%, you know, Satan songs on their first album, and then the Black Metal album itself ramps it up to two thirds. Merciful Fate, Melissa, the first <laughs> album, almost every song is touching on Satan pretty heavily. And A Dangerous Meeting, still well over half the songs, five out of eight. Um, yeah, it's very strong Satan lyrical themes. 
then you get to running wild and gates to purgatory yeah okay half branded and exiled not a thing so i have i think you know the numbers you know bear this out a little bit why is running wild continuously dumped in the 80s black metal bin with these other bands if you're doing so you're really just saying that their very first album is half satan and half not satan i feel like if that's the bar there's a lot of other things that could probably also then be shoved into the 80s black metal genre that we would normally never associate with the style whatsoever now if i one you know sort of footnote here someone could say oh well what about the you know, running wild ep that also came out in 1984 alongside Gates of Purgatory. Well, I took a look at that too. It has three songs on it. Two of them are about Satan. One isn't. Uh, but one of the three songs is once again, Victim of State's Power. And then I already discussed the issue with that one. So even there, you've got one strong Satan song, one that's not, one that's just witches and creepy stuff. And then you've got Victim of Saints Power, which uses Lucifer as sort of a role model for rebellion against the system and political stuff. Uh, yeah, again, it, it's not exactly you know, Melissa or black metal or you know stuff like that. So there you have it. This is my case for officially removing Running Wild from the discussion of 80s black metal forever. I'm sorry, but I just don't get that. You know, Priest or uh, Running Wild was very much coming, you know, from Judas Priest style roots. They looked a lot like Judas Priest. They sounded a lot like Judas Priest, different style vocals, of course. They named their band after a Judas Priest song. You know, they do those big anthems. Chains and Leather is very much, you know, a take on all the world or United type track. Those first two albums are full of Judas Priestisms, much, much more so than they're full of Venomisms. So I just don't think there's enough material there on those first two Running Wild albums to warrant putting Running Wild in the black metal category. And of course, after album number two, Running Wild changed course completely, uh, dropped all of that kind of stuff, went for the pirate imagery, and sailed on into the pages of history. The rest of the story we know is very different. So I've made my case. Now let's talk metal in the comments down below. Am I just being sort of a jerk and black, uh, black metal clearly that's, you know, belongs to and should have running wild within it? Uh, do I just not like it because I think of them as more of a power metal band? Um, what do you think? Would you call Running Wild black metal in their early days, or is there not enough material there? Are there some other bands like this that kind of straddle the line that maybe sometimes get listed as 80s black metal, and you've always thought to yourself, wait a second, do they really belong there? Uh, I don't know, but I'll be interested to see what names other people have that uh, grind their gears a little bit on this subject too. All right, with that, let's bring this one to a close. So until next time, everybody take care and uh, keep wearing chains and leather, just like Satan would.